Salutations, respected viewers. I am George from Ireland. This video is about the French Wars of Religion, um, especially looking at how they impacted on the British Isles. Because I've had a request for uh, from one of my many faithful fans for a video on this very head. So, in the early 16th century, Protestantism as we know it emerged. We probably did it to uh, 1521. So Martin Luther, he'd written his 95 theses four years earlier at Wittenberg. The idea of him nailing them on the university church is a 19th century fallacy. He wrote them, he didn't nail them. But anyway, then Protestantism emerged. There was fighting in Germany and so on. But anyway, fast forward to France, what's what, what we're really interested in. Protestantism spread like wildfire throughout Western Europe. Now, it was stronger in Northern Europe than in Southern Europe, just to, just to really simplify. So um, France was a Catholic country, and in those days, religion was not regarded as a private matter. It was very much the government's business, uh, what your religious denomination was. People believed in the divine right of kings, so the king is appointed by the Almighty, and the king's duty is to make sure that the true religion, whatever he perceives that to be, was believed and practiced in the, in the realm. And the king would have to answer to God when he died. So the two denominations in France were Roman Catholics and Protestants. Protestants from France were known as Huguenots. There are various theories about that. The etymology of it could be Eidgenosse, the German for oath, comrade. Switzerland was one of the few countries with a Protestant uh, majority, and I won't go into why there were Swiss independence from 1291, but the Swiss swore an oath to liberty. Different cantons of Switzerland, some are Protestant, some are Catholic, in the old days, if you were a minority, if you're in the wrong one, you'd be discriminated against. If you don't like it, move to another canton. Um, so uh, Huguenot, it may have been derived from the name of an early French Protestant leader. So uh, there was sort of a three-sided civil war in France. We talk about the French wars of religion. Note it's wars, plural. It's a series of several separate wars um, over 50-odd years. And um, on the Catholic side was the Catholic League an organisation led by the Duke of Guise. The Duke of Guise was one of the leading noblemen of France, had many estates in northeastern France. And obviously there wasn't just one Duke of Guise when he died, his son inherited that, so there were a few generations of the Guise family leading the Catholic League. Obviously, ultimately, the Pope is in charge of the Catholic Church and he resides at Rome. The Pope in those days was almost always Italian. From the early um, 16th century, right up and down in 1978, Every single pope was Italian. Prior to that, but there'd been a few popes of different nationalities, including French. Um, anyway, um, on the other side were the Huguenots, that's to say the Protestants. In the middle was the French royal family, the Valois family. Now, the Valois family were Catholics, but they were not ardently so. As we're going to see, it later becomes the Bourbon family, relatives of the Valois family, who get the crown of France. So... Um, Anyway, uh, the, though the um, Valois family, the royal family, they were Catholics, they weren't necessarily anti-Protestant, and they were prepared to countenance uh, uh, parity for the Protestants, especially if they could have a quiet life in return. And eventually that's what happened for a century. Um, so the King of France, he sometimes sided with the Catholic League, and sometimes he'd side with the Huguenots, even though the King was Catholic, because the, the Catholic League grew so mighty that it was challenging the authority of the, um, of the royal family. France was something like 80% Catholic, 20% Protestant, but it's difficult to say. The, the default setting was Catholic. People would have simply assume that you were Catholic unless you said otherwise. Now, some people are ardently religious and have a very strong identity one way or the other. A lot of people are um, don't, don't give much thought to these things. They just follow the crowd and they don't have any deeply held beliefs. They'll uh, just um, do whatever it takes to survive. So the French royal family re reviewed the Catholic League as fanatical, as causing all sorts of problems. So there were certain um, noble houses that were luminaries of the Huguenot cause, particularly the Coligny family, the Prince de Condé, um, and the Bourbons we're going to see. So the Bourbons were distant cousins of the Valois family, as in the royal family. So there was a kingdom nestled in the Pyrenees in between France and Spain called Navarre. Um, is now regarded as part of Spain. So uh, anyway, the, the Bourbons, they were kings of Navarre. Um, so the French Wars of Religion, they only acquired this name um, long after they ceased. People looking back at them, 
uh, regarded them as uh, as the French Wars of Religion, put them together, makes it easier to understand. A bit like the Wars of the Roses in England is only the 19th century. In retrospect, people label them w Wars of the Roses. Or indeed, looking back at the Hundred Years' War centuries later, they say that conflict in the um, late 14th and early 15th century was one conflict, the Wars of the Roses. So remember these French Wars of Religion, there were, there were long periods of peace in between. Could be decades of peace in between. So the, by the late 16th century, Protestantism had reached its high tide. Okay, Poland very briefly went Protestant, a fact which is often forgotten, as did Austria. Then Emperor Rudolf II restored Austria to Catholicism. Um, so it looked like Europe might go mainly Protestant. Europe had reached tipping point and the Catholic Church might be utterly defeated. So um, uh, th those countries, Austria and Poland, they returned to the Catholic fold and they did so with a vengeance. Uh, to um, compensate for their previous lapse. Want to make sure there was no relapse. Um, anyway, but in the 1560s, it really appeared that Europe could go either way. We now know that Western Europe, a majority of it's Catholic. Of those who are Christians at all, something like two-thirds are Christians. Um, but it was, it was more like even Stevens in the, in the 1560s. Um, uh, so if it reached tipping point, that was it. Could, could Catholicism be completely extirpated? Well, I don't want anyone's religious denomination to be extirpated. Obviously, we ought to have religious liberty and equality. But these were, we would be regarded as revolutionary nostra in the 16th century. So Spain was the uh, chief Roman Catholic power at the time. And naturally, it weighed in on the side of the Catholic League. Remember, the um, King of Spain had this honorific from the Pope, his most Catholic majesty. And England was the uh, pr primary Protestant power in Europe. Though England was nothing like as powerful then as it was later to become. So, um, until the mid-19th century, Italy was, as Prince Metternich later said, a geographical expression and a very loosely defined one at that. Italy was divided into some two dozen states, kingdoms, duchies, counties, free cities, and of course the papal states. Notice that's plural, papal states. So central Italy comprised these papal states. The Pope ruled them as a... As a um, uh, secular ruler as well as a religious leader and he sent um, a legate to rule each one of these several papal states. Uh, the legate would be a cardinal. Now remember in the Catholic Church obviously goes priest, um, bishop, archbishop and then the Pope. So uh, some of the popes are appointed cardinals, some of the, oh, stop, forgive me, some of the archbishops are appointed cardinals, some archbishops are not cardinals and the Pope can appoint other people cardinals. So I don't want to go too much more about what a cardinal is roughly 100 cardinals in the world and when the pope's when the pope dies the college of cardinal meets college of cardinals meets at rome college is not being an educational institution just um a professional body or an elective body better and the cardinals discuss who they should elect as pope and they elect a new pope almost well actually invariably from amongst themselves so that's not actually a rule a rule strictly speaking the um cardinals could elect any catholic man pope so that's what a cardinal is um so a very, very high-ranking Catholic priest. Um, anyway, put simply, Spain dominated southern Italy. So the southern Italian states, allies of, the, uh, of Spain, not entirely willingly. France dominated northern Italy. So most of those northern Italian states were pro-French, sometimes because they wanted to be, sometimes they're strong arm to be. And the, the papacy ruled central Italy, the, pap the papal states. So um, we know that the, the Vatican City is still an independent country. It issues passports, it has ambassadors, they call them nuncios, as in messenger in Latin. There's the Swiss Guard, the Pope's army. There's only about 50 men then, now. But back then, it was a serious army, with tens of thousands of troops. You had the Pontifical Navy as well, which was a formidable navy. The Pope was then much more than a spiritual leader. He was a um, major political player. Um, so the French Wars of Religion, they spilled over into Italy, despite the fact that something like 99% of Italians were Catholics. There's a lot of double think here. Yes, I'm a Catholic and I'm going to fight against the Pope. It, it, it happened a lot down the centuries. So um, anyway, remember there's the Kingdom of Two Sicilies, which is the island of Sicily and a bit of the mainland around Naples. And so that was um, uh, pro-Spanish. Remember there's the, the Catalan language and uh, the um, uh, west coast of Sardinia, still um, Catalan speaking. Go to Naples in Italy, there's um, Il Quartiere Spagnolo, the Spanish Quarter. And so Neapolitan di dialect owes quite a lot to the Spanish language. So remember, um, Sardinia had been part of the Kingdom of Aragon for a couple of centuries. Um, so going back to France, um, 
uh, it's, it's not the case that 80% of people were staunch Catholics, they might have been nominal Catholics. And if the, if the Huguenots really won, most of them would have, would have changed over. There are not that many people are willing to die for their faith. So it takes a brave soul to, to really stand up for his or her faith. Just the majority of people around here, whatever denomination, all right, I'll go along, along with that. So the, the Huguenots were overrepresented in the army and the navy. Um, so they were um, they'd been abroad more on, on military service, perhaps that's what brought them into contact with Protestant notions in the first instance. The Huguenots were also concentrated in particular areas of the country, which helped them survive. There were a majority in a few areas on the Atlantic coast around, around La Rochelle, remember many of them were sailors, in the Pyrenees Mountains, as in Navarre, where the, where the Bourbons were. So they could hold out in this mountain fastness in the Alps, that's eastern France. These were areas which were more defensible. Um, so they could not be so easily uh, extirpated. Um, so the Huguenots in, in, in the Pyrenees, they obviously had the Spanish to contend with, but um, their, the mountains helped to negate any Spanish military advantage. The English sometimes sent military aid to the Huguenots and indeed soldiers to fight on their sides. So the Huguenots were not um, radical as Protestants go. They're not like Anabaptists or something like that. They simply said, why don't we say mass in French rather than Latin, a language that most people actually understand French. Having said that, not simply French, whatever the local dialect is. Remember, something like 20 languages were spoken in France back then. Dauphiné in the southwest, Niçois, Canois, Occitan, um, I can't think there are more, Breton. There's the Norman dialect of French, Flemish, Alsatian, German. Uh, I could go on. I mean, the standard French language was spoken in the Paris area. The upper class all over the place could speak French. And some merchants who travel could speak French. But remember, most people didn't go to school at all and spoke their local patois, which might have been a dialect of French or some cases not French at all, like Breton or Flemish. Um, so the Hugos were, were, were French nonetheless, and they were distinctly lukewarm about accepting English help, thought that the English might then never leave, might try and annex, annex France. And they were patriotic Frenchmen, but they said, we're trying to do the best for France, bring in Protestantism, which is proper Christianity for everybody. Um, and so the Huguenots, they occasionally rounded on the English, especially when the king took their side. So um, the uh, Huguenots could claim to be the most patriotic Frenchmen of all, and indeed there was some merit in that claim. So many of them had uh, proven their valour uh, in battling for France against the Spanish um, and in Italy and on the high seas. So the Huguenots accused the Catholic League of being stooges of the Spanish, and again, there appeared to be some uh, truth to that claim. So the Huguenots said that they were defending their homeland from a Spanish takeover. The Spanish were just simply uh, using this excuse of Catholicism in order to try and annex France, or at the very least, reduce it to vassal status. Um, anyway, because remember, Spain was becoming a superpower at the time. Most of Latin America had some colonies on the coast of, um, of uh, the African continent, not just Morocco, but now what we call say, Equatorial Guinea, even the Philippines, was bringing back ships laden with gold from, uh, from um, Latin America. El Dorado, the golden one, this mythical city they're searching for. They ruled the Netherlands and Belgium. Okay, they remember under Charles V, they've been briefly united with the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire being a central European empire. Much of Germany, Austria, um, what's now the Czech Republic, and on and on. So was a very mighty force. Um, Charles V had ruled that for some years and perhaps fatally divided it between his son and his brother uh, because if it were united, then there's nothing they couldn't have achieved. Um, so uh, the Huguenots said, let's have France for the French, whether you're Catholic or Huguenot, France for the French. That was their stance. They said, let's have tolerance and not impose our beliefs on anyone. Well, they had to say that because they said, well, we're going to force everyone to be Huguenot, then they definitely would have been defeated. So it might have just been rhetoric until such time as they gained sufficient strength, which would have allowed them to impose their uh, doctrines on others. The Catholic League said they were defending against France, and France was a Catholic country, the first daughter of the church, as the Pope had said, and that if you're going to have national unity, you must have the one true faith. And that point to um, Jesus saying to St. Peter, this is the rock upon which I build my church. Remember Peter, Petra, rock in Greek. Um, so uh, that's that. Um, and I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you say is, is bound on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you say is loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. So that's why the papal flag has got the two keys, the keys of St. Peter, one, one silver, one gold, St. Peter being the first pope. Um, anyway, 
Um, so the Catholic, Catholic League said that the Huguenots are dupes of the English, and that's putting it kindly, may well be willing traitors. So as I said, the Valois family, that's the king's family, they're worried about the Duke of Guise um, becoming over mighty and um, fear that the, the, the Guise family were uh, misusing this whole religious issue in order to build up their strength and possibly take over, maybe make an attempt to grab the crown. So the, the, the Guise family headed the Catholic League for some generations. Guise is, is a small town in northern France, but that's the region where their power base was. So there were um, a number of factors at play in choosing one's friends and one's foes. They're idealistic and then there are realistic considerations. So a Catholic could fight side with the Catholic League to fight against Protestants. On the other hand, you might say, well, on a pragmatic basis, I have to side with people of the other religious denomination. And that's, you know, the way it panned out in reality. So there were a number of attempts at reconciliation. In August 1572, Marguerite de Valois, princess of the royal family, married Henri de Navarre. She was a Catholic, he was a Huguenot. Having said that, Henri de Navarre, he'd been born, baptized a Catholic. His family then converted to Protestantism when he was little. Thousands of Huguenots came to Paris for the, for the festive occasion, the nuptials. As the Huguenots lay drunk in the streets after the night's festivities, the um, uh, Catholic League fell upon them and slaughtered them as they slept. So um, uh, on one occasion, the Catholic League showed mercy and said that heretics, I'll, I'll give you a chance. If you utter the words of uh, the creed in Latin, then your life will be spared. Henri de Navarre, he converted in order to save his skin. You should see La Reine Margot, a fabulous film, a real visual feast, and shows us, I think, just what it was like, just how hideous the situation was, and just how unprincipled many people were. So Henri de Navarre later fled Paris, got back to his own Huguenot people. He recanted his conversion to Catholicism. He said, I'm a Protestant amongst you again. And his own folk forgave him and welcomed back with open arms. Well, he did this to save his life. But then again, if you really believe, you should be happy to lay down your life, your faith. Martyrdom is a rare gift. Uh, what if Jesus had done that? Christianity wouldn't exist. Now, Nostradamus told the French queen Maria de' Medici that her three elder sons would be king and she would outlive them all. Remember Nostradamus, the supposed prophet, this mysterious chap. See the film uh, of him, also named Nostradamus. Anyway, in this case, Nostradamus spoke true. King Francis II died after um, uh, only two years of his reign, age 15. Uh, sorry, age 17. And remember, uh, he was married to Mary, Queen of Scots, who later returned to Scotland. It's a bit of a side issue. The English party and the French party in Scotland um, battling over should it be a Catholic or a Protestant nation, eventually the English party winning and Scotland being Protestant. Anyway, Francis II had died of an ear infection, which had turned into an abscess. His brother, Charles IX, succeeded him, and eight, two years later, he too was felled by natural causes. Um, and um, uh, he, he's the one who'd been elected King of Poland briefly. Then Henry III assumed the crown, the third brother. So the latter years of the French Wars of Religion are the, the War of the Three Henrys. There's Henry III, who was the king. There was Henry, the Duke of Guise, leading the Catholic League. And there was Henry de Navarre, or Henry de Bourbon, who led the Huguenots. So Henry III was childless, as his two elder brothers had been, and he saw that his, his death was approaching, so he suggested a compromise. The man with the best claim to be King of France was um, Henry de Bourbon, the King of Navarre. So if Henry um, uh, de Bourbon would convert to Catholicism, then he could be King of France. So Henry de Bourbon said, Paris vaut bien une messe. Paris is worth a mass. That's the um, Catholic religious ceremony. So he came to Notre Dame Cathedral, where he'd got married some years early to, to, earlier to Marguerite de Valois. He converted to Catholicism for a second time. And because he was received into the Roman Catholic Church, when Henry III died in 1589, um, Henri de Bourbon became King of France, King of France and also King of Navarre. And he founded the Bourbon dynasty, which ruled France. Remember the Bourbons up to and including Louis XVI, they were King of France and King of Navarre. The Navarre bit's often forgotten. So um, he spent the remainder of his life in Paris. The Huguenots accepted his conversion. They forgave him. They were guaranteed religious equality. The Edict of Nantes was promulgated in 1598. So um, the Huguenots would want to be persecuted and it ensured uh, peace by and large for um, almost a century. The Catholic League accepted the Huguenots would be 
from being permitted to worship unmolested, and they could rise to any position in the state. They were not disbarred from holding high office. So this was a marvellous model for religious tolerance amongst Christians uh, all over Christendom. The um, uh, Jewish minority was still legally discriminated against. There were virtually no Muslims in France at the time. So um, uh, Henry de Navarre, or Henry de Bourbon, whatever you want to call him, he's known as Henry IV, Henri IV. And the old Bourbon national anthem was Vive Henri IV, vive ce roi Valon, ce diable quatre, à le triple de talon, de boire et de battre et d'être envers galant. The green gallant, but gallant not meaning um, courageous, but meaning um, a lady's man. So he was um, notorious for his extramarital affairs, but this infamy seems to just endear him to the French people. As Henry Kissinger later put it, power is an aphrodisiac. Um, it aroused both um, powerful men and women to come into contact. So despite the moral strictures of the age, um, uh, aristocrats seemed to transgress the, um, these marital vows and get away with it. So Henry IV was popular for bringing these wars to a close. Um, so uh, a bit of the, that national anthem says, O oh, devil war, bitterness has gone, rancune est partie. Um, clink our glasses, like our fathers, we sing as true friends, the roses and the lilies. Uh, the roses and the lilies being the heraldic symbols of the House of uh, Will. Uh, the lilies of France and the roses of, of the Bourbons. Um, we sing the refrain, as we shall for a thousand years. May God keep his descendants in peace until one takes the moon in one's teeth. That means to achieve the impossible, because you can't take the moon in your teeth, as in, so we want peace forever. Long live France, long live King Henri, as we say in Paris, just as in Rhin. Long live France, long live um, King Henri. Rhin is a city where French kings are crowned, even though it wasn't the capital. So there were a handful of Catholic extremists who did not accept this. One of them was François Ravaillac, who approached Henry IV as the royal coach was stuck in Paris traffic. Nothing's changed then. So <clears throat> Henri IV was poignarded to death by Ravaillac. Ravaillac, um, uh, well, um, thought that uh, Henri IV, once a Protestant, always as a Protestant, didn't accept that Henry IV had truly converted to Catholicism and uh, that um, uh, tolerating uh, the Huguenots was worthy of death. So Ravaillac was then put to death in the most gruesome fashion imaginable, having his flesh torn by pincers for hours, molten lead poured into the wounds, and horses tied to his each limb to gradually rip him apart whilst alive. It was absolutely, unspeakably horrid and sadistic death. The uh, horses failed to rip his limbs from his torso, so the magistrates of Paris eventually ordered that his sinews be cut by knives to make the task easier. His family were expelled from um, France, and those who, who bore the name Ravaillac, even not related to him, were commanded to change their surname. So um, Henry IV was succeeded by his younger, by, by his young son, Louis XIII. Some years later, Louis XIII was approached by a French Benedictine monk, Jacques Clément, who, who asked for an audience with his majesty. Clément um, said he had secret information which must disclose, disclose only to the royal ear. So Louis XIII uh, signaled his bodyguards to withdraw some steps out of earshot. And once they did so, Clément um, availed himself of the opportunity to plunge a stiletto knife into the king's chest. Um, so that was the end of Louis XIII. Clement II was um, uh, punished with an execution of the most um, agonizing kind. Um, he was a Roman Catholic zealot, but he thought that the king was about to declare war on the papacy, which was balderdash. So failure to persecute Protestants was apostasy in Clement's view. Um, one didn't expect a monk to do this kind of thing, to be violent. So Louis XIII, he's the one who closed down the Estates General and ordered that the pesky politicians be put to death without trial. His sister was Henrietta Maria, as in married to King Charles I. And that's why Henrietta Maria was saying to her husband, you know, you have trouble with Parliament. Well, my brother had a similar problem in France. I'll tell you what you do. You simply order them arrested. It doesn't matter what the law is. You're the king. You get them arrested. Anyone who's giving you a jip, just say, chop off their heads. That's it. And then you'll have no more trouble from them. Remember when Louis XIII, when he dissolved the Estates General, that's the French Parliament, he wasn't summoned again for 175 years. Um, so because he really believed in um, uh, the divine right of kings. So he was succeeded by um, uh, Louis XIV, who was a toddler. So um, religious strife was, it was largely over in France until 1685. Louis, the, Louis XIII's son, 
Louis XIV, ruled as a Catholic. Now, he flirted with Gallicanism, a bit like Anglicanism. Say, all right, we will, I'll tell you what, we will still have all the Catholic practices and doctrines. One thing will change. King of France is head of the church. All the reassuring rituals that you like in festivals, we can carry on with that, you know, adulation of the saints or um, veneration of the Blessed Virgin. But, you know, I appoint the bishops and archbishops. The money stays here. We're not sending it to Rome. We can tune the, tune the pulpit. They actually didn't go for that in the end. But um, the, the, um, the Catholic League was still agitating for proper Catholicism. We mustn't permit Protestantism. That's immoral. So finally, in 1685, Louis XIV revoked the Edict of Nantes. There'll be no more toleration for Protestants. They weren't going to be killed, but they would be discriminated against by law. And they could not ascend to high office. And that's why about two thirds of French Protestants decamped. They moved to Ireland, to Great Britain, to the Netherlands, occasionally to Germany. You sometimes meet Germans with a typically French name. They're often of Huguenot descent, even to South Africa. Right, so that's a little bit about the French wars of religion in which there were large massacres on both sides. So um, don't perceive it as simply, you know, Catholics persecuting Protestants, though that did happen. Um, there was obviously Protestants persecuting Catholics too. Not suggesting one side is good, one side is evil. Not, not here to either demonize or to eulogize, simply to uh, tell the historical truth.